Welcome. My name is Amina Mlani, and I have the privilege of serving as your host. The role of cognitive screenings in audiology has been and continues to be a topic of discussion. In this special edition of This Week in Hearing, which is sponsored by Cogniview, I am joined by two distinguished physicians who have experience in the diagnosis, treatment, and management of persons with cognitive decline, and will share their thoughts on the topic of cognitive screening and the role of the audiologist. So welcome, gentlemen. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me. Absolutely. So let's start out with uh, a little bit of an introduction. So Dr. Ma, I'll start with you. Uh, Dr. Fred Ma is the Chief Medical Officer and Senior Vice President at Cogniview. Can you share with the audience a little bit about yourself, please? Sure. Uh, Thank you, Amin, for the invitation. My name is Dr. Fred Ma. I'm the Senior VP and the CMO of uh, Cogniview, Inc. I'm located in Rochester, New York. Um, where the neuroscience company uh, developed and manufactured um, the cognitive assessment device for a mild and early stage of cognitive um, decline. So my background was uh, um, trained in neurosurgeon and a neuroscientist with 40 years experience, including uh, neurological practices, and then also um, uh, the research in the um, pharmaceutical and medical device arenas as an executive. So my passion is uh, really to find a good tools for early, um, early stage of a cognitive uh, decline to help uh, to build a process of diagnostic assessment um, for um, primary care, a neurological, and the non-MD, MD channel, and the overall um, healthcare providers to give them the tools to prevent um, the developments of uh, dementia and Alzheimer. Thank you for having me. Yeah. Oh wow, that's that's tremendous. Um, we also have Dr. Artashir Hashmi, and he is the endowed chair for geriatric innovation and the section chief of geriatrics at Cleveland Clinic. So Dr. Hashmi, would you please share a little bit about yourself? Sure, thanks again for uh, having me. Um, I've, uh, before joining Cleveland Clinic, I've been uh, you know, at um, Harvard and Boston, uh, at the Mass General Hospital, uh, where I was in a similar leadership role. And then uh, prior to that training at Yale and Harvard. And so my area of, uh, niche area of interest is uh, aging and technology, especially as relates to my role as chair for geriatric innovation at the clinic. We are within the Institute for Population Health, or Cleveland Clinic Community Care, as we call it. And um, our geriatricians are all consultative, um, successful aging specialists. We're at 10 different sites across Northeast Ohio, outpatient, and then about three different uh, inpatient sites. And then with consultative links to Florida and Toronto and um, a little bit internationally at Cleveland Clinic Abu Dhabi in London. So that, that's sort of emerging work in my, in my area. Wow. Again, two distinguished uh, physicians here on our panel today to talk about this really interesting uh, development was as, as audiology starts to look at cognitive screening as part of, uh, you know, as part of uh, the management and treatment of these individuals. So as we get started here, you know, what is Dr. Hashmi, the professional scope of the physician when it comes to cognitive decline and dementia? Excellent question. I mean, I think it's a very dynamically changing definition and it needs to change because the, um, the, the challenge of cognitive impairment and dementia just nationally and even globally is immense. And so it can no longer be the province or domain of a select few highly trained specialists, if you will, in, in cognitive impairment. It needs to be a team-based approach and um, I think that that scope is increasing to, uh, you know, a diversity of different specialists, including audiologists, geriatricians, um, and, and others who can see multiple facets of this very challenging illness and, and, and the multiple contributors, both within the brain and external to the brain, um, sort of have set up things in a way where it's very natural for these allied specialists uh, in the field of cognitive impairment um, to really come together as a team and, and look at those various uh, contributors, if you will, uh, and also potential solutions. Because I, So I think in totality, uh, it's a team that's coming together and that scope is uh, ever-changing and dynamic. 
Yeah, and, and what's interesting, and you know, as 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 an outside person from from you know within the healthcare arena, but outside of of your area, we typically think of cognitive decline being treated by pharmaceuticals. Hmm. And as you pointed out, it's an expansion now. So, can you talk a little bit about that? Absolutely. I mean, thirty years now, uh, or and more, I guess, of research, which is based on hypotheses that are very pharmaceutical driven. And, and backed in many cases. And, and so, you know, the results of that are very compelling. It, it has failed, you know, this 30 years of research to find that silver bullet, you know, the one medication that's gonna pharmaceutically solve everything. And um, much to the um, real, um, you know, chagrin and, and, and really disappointment of so many families, uh, not just patients being affected by this, but families around them. And so, um, I think that has led to multiple alternative hypotheses to challenge the amyloid hypothesis as the only one uh, for, for dementia and specifically Alzheimer's dementia. And as people have looked at those hypotheses, they've found different mechanistic explanations for what's going on. And within those mechanisms, potential solutions that don't just lie in pharmaceuticals, but lie in addressing the root causes, the multiple root causes such as hearing loss, macular degeneration, sleep disorders, um, vitamin deficiencies. And so um, I think, um, you know, very, uh, not only very interesting, but I think very promising if we choose to look at it that way. Yeah. Yeah. And, and as you're talking about these external factors and these hypotheses, right, there's the Lancet report that came out in 2017. And then again, just most recently. So Dr. Ma, can you talk a little bit about the Lancet report and how there are these modifiable risk factors that could potentially reduce the opportunities to have cognitive decline or lessen the impact of cognitive decline. Yes. Um, yeah. Just, uh, um, just in lieu of the uh, Dr. Hashmi's comments, you know, um, recent years, and there are many studies that found association between untreated hearing loss, Alzheimer's disease, and other type of dementia meaning people with hearing loss are more likely to develop a cognitive problem than people who do not have hearing loss. This is an area of intense research with many unanswered questions. So that's brought the question, should we look at it, this area to get more in-depth research? As of today, the several studies indicated people with hearing loss may develop cognitive decline earlier than peers with normal hearing that's surfaced. A team at, the, at John Hopkins look at the uh, um, cognitive impaired scores over six years in a study of nearly 200, uh, 2,000 seniors. They concluded that those with hearing loss had a fast decline, faster decline. The volunteers with all cognitively normal, when the research began, but the studies end, to the study end, people with hearing loss with 24% more likely to meet the standard of a cognitive impairment compared to the people with normal hearing. Therefore, John Hopkins, John Hopkins a researcher predicted while this is, you know, while you have this is a phenomenon and that, you know, require in-depth follow-up. And then the you know, non, you know the modifiable risk factor that has to be including the hearing loss. You know, right now the, the hearing loss has become a number one, which is possess eight percent of a modifiable risk factor. Meaning, if you could mitigate the hearing loss, you could gain nine percent of delayed you know dementia population. You know, WHO also echoed for that. WHO estimate about 466 million people worldwide or 5% of population living with a disabled hearing loss, that figure could expect almost doubled uh, to 900 million people to uh, 2050. So therefore there are multiple research and then Dr. Hashmi mentioned the hypothesis about this, whether there is, you know, connection between the cognitive impairment and the declining of sensory utility. Yes, it is. Such early work has been followed by decades of ongoing research that was sort of significantly explored the hearing loss and the, you know, 
that poor cognitive you know, uh, outcomes. So therefore, I think it is now widely accepted concept that untreated hearing loss leads to structural and functional atrophy within the brain as a result of deprived auditory stimulation and the increase in cognitive loading required to process environment, you know, environmental sounds, speed, and music, right? So to conclude, what I'm saying is, you know, based on the uh, Lancet, the journal, research have uh, formed the hearing loss is the number one modifiable risk for cognitive decline when identified and addressed in midlife. So um, I think it is really meaningful for us to talk about this. Now, how can we engage the mitigation factor for um, assessment, diagnostic, and prevention? Yeah, and, and, and as you're talking, the thing that's going through my head is, is we've got a huge, huge number of individuals that have this manifestation. You don't have the you don't have the number on the other side on, on, on to, to provide for these individuals. So now we have these modifiable risk factors, Dr. Hashmi, and you're talking about these secondary individuals who could potentially help reduce this so that we don't have an overtaxing situation on our healthcare system. Am I understanding that correctly? Uh, no, absolutely. Uh, absolutely. You're, you're well said. And, and I think the key thing, as I was hearing, you know, both you and, and Dr. Ma just now, is the timing of this is absolutely key. Timing in uh, multiple sort of facets of that. So one is obviously the challenge before us, but the other is within an individual's journey um, with, you know, sort of early mild cognitive impairment all the way through all the fast stages of cognitive decline to the advanced stages. You know, it's typically, unless it's, you know, sort of in, in the setting of a stroke, is typically a, a slow progression. The dangerous thing about this, this is happening sort of subclinically, even before we realize it or other people around us realize it for several decades. You know, those internal neuro, neuro, neuro degenerative changes are already happening and, and, and we don't screen for it early enough. And because we don't screen up for it, for these things early enough, me screening not just for cognitive impairment for all the contributing risk factors that the Lancet sort of paper outlines, the the um, travesty that that leads to then is that by the time that people do get the attention they need, the options are very limited. Whereas if they had been identified early and we had done something about these risk factors early on in the piece, addressing that would have brought into play even some of the pharmaceuticals, which 100% of them are all designed to slow the progression. None of them can reverse it, right? So logically what, what that would entail is you pick up something early do something about it early, addressing it holistically with all the risk factors addressed and try to preserve that function as quickly as you can. Um, and I think um, that approach is much needed. Yeah, and, and as you're saying that, you know, I go back to the earlier comment that you made that this just can't be a narrow group of individuals. This has yeah. to be a collection of individuals. Yeah. And, you know, uh, in audiology, we generally see, you know, we, you know, we service everybody across the lifespan, but we generally end up seeing more elderly people. Yeah. So the audiologist has a potential role, right? Which is what the Cognivue device is, is uh, there to help with. There's our others, right? There's the, the MOCA and, and the Toronto scale and so forth and so on, right? The Montreal scale. But how is it that we as secondary specialists, as, as audiologists, how is it, gentlemen, that we can potentially help with the um, reduction of this manifestation accelerating in the roles that we have today. So I'll give my, my two cents on it and invite Dr. Ma for his comments. Um, to my mind, a little bit of reversing this, this the, the terminology. You know, in my mind, in the next several decades, what will emerge is that the primary specialists are actually you know, specialists such as our audiologist colleagues, because they are at the front line, there are facets of that that they can uncover, have conversations about much earlier into the point that we were just discussing, than the secondary specialists, which I think the second line of defense almost, are the geriatricians or successful aging specialists, where you go in for the more in-depth sort of assessment. 
but but I think um, the pandemic, I mean, has taught us many, many things. One of the things that I will say just anecdotally is for all of my patients, 100% of any of my patients, and we see you know more than 4,000 new patients with new cognitive impairment every year at, at our center, every one of them, the cognitive impairment has worsened during the pandemic, not even because their risk factors changed so much, right? Because they didn't change in the last year and not really directly because of COVID, but because of the social isolation mm. and mental health challenges, the depression, the loneliness that set in. And now you can imagine you throw in hearing loss into that and how much of a contributing factor is that to isolation, even amongst many people around you, right? Just not being part of that conversation, being perhaps too proud to sort of admit to that and, and or thinking there's nothing that can be done about that, right? So that social isolation and that depression that is a very clear risk factor for cognitive impairment, you know, documented, chronicled by many, many papers and many guidelines. And yet we only think about the pharmaceutical aspect of it. We only think about the knee-jerk response. We never think about, well, there's contributor here, right? Why is that person being left out of the conversation? So, um, so I, I think that that uh, really primes audiologists in two ways to contribute. One, in raising awareness and education of, um, you know, their clinical colleagues in terms of their own role, but in terms of interaction with patients about, this is not just sensory impairment one dimensional, this is multi-dimensional and with a very clear solid line leading to cognitive impairment and a dotted line leading through social isolation. So I think that's one. And, and I think the other is um, really the early, early picking up, you know, screening, the early identification, and then the subsequent communication and loop back with how is that person doing? They're likely to see people at the front lines much more frequently than they are to see the new definition of secondary specialist, which is someone like me, for example. Yeah. Dr. Ma, you are, you are, you are. Yes. Um, yeah, I want to concur what the doctor uh, asked me just uh, alluded to. I, it, it's definitely, first of all, I, I kind of a, um, wanted to... Uh, adjust this comments and the secondary specialist, you know, um, as Dr. Hasmi mentioned, um, you know, for the past 30 years, and uh, if not longer, uh, we failed and uh, with a pharmaceutical driven, <clears throat> you know, uh, care for um, dementia and uh, um, Alzheimer's disease. And also, we are not very successful and then to rely on totally on the um, primary care and uh, uh, neurological specialists because uh, we're so reactive, but not proactive. So now we need to take the proactive uh, action that's engage um, the audiology, optometry, as a frontline, not a secondary specialist. Because as of today, there are many scientific links and hypotheses have been proposed between the hearing loss and the cognition to explain how hearing loss may link to progressive cognitive decline and dementia. So I summarize it with a common cause and then two cascading cause. Um, one is, you know, uh, is a common cause is the both hearing loss and the cognitive decline sharing the same widespread neurodegenerative causes. Okay, so therefore, I echo what Dr. Hashmi just mentioned, you know, the, uh, the hearing loss can cascade via social effects with the experience of hearing loss cascading into social disengagement, loneliness, depression, cascading to accelerated brain atrophy and accelerated cognitive decline and dementia. Second is cascade via audit, uh, uh, auditory uh, deprivation, Auditory deprivation result in the in 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 impoverished you know cortical input, yeah. causing neoplastic changes, cascading into cognitive decline and dementia. That's already approved with many many publications. Finally, the cognitive load that's in depth in the in the neurological uh, research showing hearing loss causing cognitive resource to be diverted from memory function into auditory processing and adding to the cognitive load and the leading to cognitive decline and dementia. Therefore, 
you know, how can we exclude all the, uh, you know, ideologies from this, you know, whole picture as a secondary, you know, specialist? You can't. So um, I think also, you know, Dr. Hashmi and I published a, um, a survey for uh, post, uh, post-COVID syndrome um, brain fog with a, a short period of time. And now we have a long longitudinal research for a large population, definitely echoed what Dr. Hashmi just indicated, the longer you have this pandemic going, the, uh, the worse the brain fog will impact the you know, people's um, life, no matter you have a previous dementia or you didn't have that, you know, you didn't have that. That's social economic effects and plays a big role. That's the fact of everything. So um, I, you know, I encourage, and I am very, very excited to uh, move this in the front line as a primary uh, specialist and then to work with side by side with a primary care, geriatric care and neurological care to care about this, uh, uh, you know, the, um, uh, the, uh, uh, the dementia and then also cognitive, uh, um, uh, you know, impairment potentially. Yeah, so it's, it's, it's really fascinating what you gentlemen are saying. So, you know, we've established the fact that this is an issue. We've established the fact now that there's a need for um, help, right? Physicians and other healthcare workers working together. So now let's start the process, if you will, about talking about how is this being used clinically? So at Cleveland Clinic, for example, how is cognitive screening a part of the healthcare system there? That's a great question. So at the clinic, um, again, there's what we've had, which I'll describe first, and then where we want to sort of continue to evolve the process to. So what we have in place right now is our successful aging platform, which basically means, I mean, when I first joined the clinic, I mean, it wasn't for lack of resources in general for older patients. There were, it was a rich in resources but they were very fragmented. You know, it was the sort of the traditional healthcare delivery model of you go to your, you know, physician with whether it's your primary care physician or specialist, it doesn't matter. You have limited amount of time for them. So you're forced to prioritize your top three issues that you want to talk about. And that time goes by very quickly, as we all know from our own experiences for ourselves and for our family members. And so what happens to all of the other issues that the clinician who's facing you, your PCP or specialist may not have his front of mind as being really a core important issue. You know, they may be talking to you about your blood pressure and your diabetes, but they may never even get to your cognitive impairment, your hearing loss, you know, all the other sort of contributing risk factors because it's just lack of awareness. So that's one, the time, you know, compression, if you will. And then because they're faced with these time pressures, the the knee-jerk response then is for anything that I didn't get to, I'll basically refer to five different specialists who now the patient and family have to take five different days off from work to go and see in five different places. And even within one health system, I mean, that is, can be a quite a challenge uh, for something that is as large as, you know, our, our healthcare system, for example, or any, any large academic health center. And so that's what was baseline when I sort of first uh, started working on this and my role and um, wanted very much to try to to defragment, if you will, the situation and make sure that folks have a sort of one-stop shopping experience, if you will, from multiple services all under one roof or all on a common platform um, and with sufficient time so that you're meeting with not just an individual clinician and that's it, but you're meeting with a team that is sort of tailored with precision to your needs as a patient or the needs of you and your family even, right? In a sort of crucial partnership. So we established then the sexual aging platform with these sort of longer visits with you know partners like Dr. Mine, sort of with the vision that we want to take this to now is trying to put diagnosticians who have done this for a long time in partnership with a new team that is looking at this at top of license from their different vantage points and equipping each of those members with state-of-the-art technology, right? Imagine the power of that, you know, state-of-the-art technology with the best minds 
the benefit is only going to be for patients and families everywhere. And so um, we've tried to do that. So the way that we're trying to reimagine that with partners like Dr. Ma and you know, Cleveland Clinic Audiology as well is um, have this as a two-tiered process. You know, at the front lines, you know, again, to, to underscore what Dr. Ma said, have the um, patients who are seeing the audiologist be screened with the state-of-the-art technology with Cognivu, uh, with the version that will give instant you know, results back. And I'll let Dr. Ma speak more to which type of technology that is. Um, and then with that instant sort of readout, like where do we go from here, have a very direct link to the successful aging program and come to us with more in-depth assessment where we, again, use state-of-the-art technology with Cognivu that is even more in-depth and have that detailed sort of discussion about with you as an individual patient or family, here are your risk factors, here's what we can do about them together as a team. And these are the individuals that you'll meet today. Plus, you know, the relationship with us will continue until we have a very solidified plan in place. And you feel secure as a patient family that, you know, there's empowerment for you to take care of your loved ones and yourself. Um, and, and that, again, loops them back into whoever they may be seeing, whether they would be seeing uh, Cleveland Clinic Audiology, whether they're seeing us, or they're, they're seeing the pharmacist, whoever, whenever that point of uh, contact has happened at whatever touch point, we then check in multiple times to make sure that that plan is in place. People are feeling secure, comfortable, and really, um, you know, that we have um, optimized their function at whatever point of the spectrum that we first met them. So, um, I think it's exciting. And so that's sort of been the Cleveland Clinic experience. It's, a, it's incredible. So you, 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 you're sharing information and you're improving clinical efficiencies. I mean, the two things that healthcare you know, absolutely needs. Uh, it's, just, it's, it's wonderful to hear that. Um, I'm going to shift over to Dr. Ma. You know, in, in, in terms of just very quickly, uh, in terms of the use of cognitive screenings, what have you seen in various clinics that you work with? Yeah, uh, based on my experience, and I am a neurosurgeon myself, and also um, have been working in um, Johnson Johnson, um, Merck, and G Healthcare as a um, as a C suite. I've been struggling, struggling working in this field, struggling to looking for um, objective, you know, timely, and also accurate precision testing to capture early stage of a cognitive impairment. That's what I'm looking for. So, and as, as both of you mentioned, currently in the most popular paper and pencil cognitive assessment, that's what we're using. And we have been using since ever since the early 70s, Dr. Hashmi. This is MOCA, MMSE, SLOMS, now the, and then the many, many um, different um, batteries. <clears throat> this is the three oh, I just mentioned was representative. However, as this batteries and tests have been, you know, although it's widely accepted and frequently used throughout the medical societies, but its drawbacks and also hit us and you know, substantially um, is really hard to mitigate in terms of highly subjectivity, you know, subject to uh, practice effects and time. In, in, in intensive or, or expensive or, or even sensitive. So therefore, from a, a physician, from a clinician, and from a neuroscientist standpoint, I, you know, take away my executive head. So I'm looking for objective, timely, and really um, reliable tools that give me um, a quick assessment or screening um, way to, uh, to help the clinician, whether it is in the audiology clinic or geriatric clinic or primary care, to get a sense on how the status uh, of cognitive, uh, you know, the uh, function of the patient. Um, and then we can align with um, the other, um, it's just like Dr. Hashmi mentioned, align with the other partners of the uh, healthcare providers and to form a very efficient, effective uh, treatment uh, plan for the patients. Therefore, the, uh, um, the Cognivil uh, is the one that um, I hope that will become um, the favorable um, 
a favorable tool to um, to be widely accepted because um, it's possess all this you know um, all these characters and then provide um, you know the objective um, assessment uh, components and remove the bias and the environment of you know variabilities accurately record and document the various uh, neural psychophysics abilities and no need for extensive training and then administered uh, the test. So it really benefits the physician. One, you know, the report is immediately available after test. Two, it can be used to refer the patients to, you know, to, to whoever need to be referred, like a PCP, like a neurological specialist. And the three can be used as part of overall cognitive function and mental health evaluation, diagnostic and follow-up. Yeah, again, it's about reducing the biases, improving the clinical efficiencies and providing information. And as you both have alluded to, it's about having that patient then move quicker through that, that healthcare system so that they can be treated in a better way to you know, lessen any issues that they may have so that their quality of life is expanded uh, over, over time. I, I think that's incredible. Um, you know, and, and one of the things that, that we often get asked or one of the questions that often comes up is, and, and, and Dr. Ma, you alluded to this as, as, as did Dr. Hashmi, you know, can these screening tools, can they identify sensory issues from brain issues? Is there a way to do that so that individuals can make the right treatment judgments, whether it's a referral or in the case of an audiologist, it's the rehabilitation component? Is, there, is that available? I mean, I think it's a, it's a composite. Uh, I think we've got to be very realistic and pragmatic uh, about uh, what is and is not possible. And I think that, you know, while there is in the research realm, certainly, uh, you know, a lot of um, ability or ideas in terms of trying to um, screen together or at the same time, I think in current state, it is using um, the best that we have and trying to co-locate it. And by the co-location, I don't just mean physical co-location, I mean also on a virtual sort of platform. And so because the sensory issues are so key and we need to distinguish them from the cognitive issues, but also explore the links, right? So it's both, it's both. Um, that is why something such as unified platform in this partnership, you know, this, I would say even tripartite partnership between the individuals on this uh, webinar um, and all the folks who are tuning into it is so key. I mean, it's integral. You take one part out and you have a key piece missing, you right. know, could be the sensory piece, could be the cognitive piece. And definitely you'd never get to the link if there is one, um, if in any one of these pieces of the jigsaw puzzle is missing. Yeah, I, I will add it. Yeah, so definitely it's, it's, it's kind of a uh, the circle. Um, they're uh, composed of uh, um, all the components are together in that circle and then you're missing one is cannot, you know, the, the making a circle. For instance, you know, we have two products. One is um, a cognitive clear, uh, uh, clarity, um, which is, you know, the 10 minutes medical grade testing device used by neurolog uh, neurologists and other physicians to assist the diagnosing cognitive condition. And then we have five minutes cognitive thrive, the consumer grade screening device, which was developed to enable, uh, you know, automated cognitive assessment of patients outside the primary care setting. When a cognitive assessment will benefit patients' outcomes such as a supplement to audiological and ocular evaluation with that, you know, kind of a complementary to each other that thrive, you know, become a conjunctive tool for evaluating cognitive function. While it is not intended as a standalone diagnostic tool, but it will help you know, audiologists to get a sense and refer to Dr. Hashmi from a geriatric care or, you know, primary care standpoint to do extensive, you know, uh, assessment for further diagnostic. Yeah. Yeah. And, 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 and so as, as I'm listening to you both, and I wasn't clear in my question, but it basically sounds like we all need to communicate together to make this model efficient. And if we're missing a component, then it could potentially be negatively impactful for that patient. 
And so that conversation needs to be widespread between the physician, the patient, and whoever else is within this, this, this journey that this patient is going to take. And so as, as we're looking at cognitive screenings and as we're looking at uh, all of the healthcare providers working together in order to move this thing forward, you know, are there opportunities, as you pointed out, Dr. Ma, for other special other other aspects of the uh, office to get involved? So, for example, your devices here do not necessarily need someone to administer them because they're self-administering. So, can we get a front office staff individual to start the process, which would then allow the clinician to do something else for clinical efficiency purposes? And then the, the provider and the patient could connect again and say, this is the outcome. And again, sharing information, we need to share this information with your primary care physician. We need to refer you and so forth and so on. What are your thoughts on that? Well, um, that's, a, that's a big question, actually. And it's an excellent question. And uh, um, from a cognitive, as an executive standpoint, I wanted to have this device in the, you know, to be placed it everywhere, and because it can be placed in everywhere, and then as long as there is a healthcare, um, healthcare providing uh, functions in that office or clinics, um, because of that, the you know, people um, who are utilizing to get assessment or screening of the patients doesn't need, you know too comprehensive or, or medical license, you know, as long as you are trained and to how to operate and then to, um, to coach people to use that ma machine. However, there's another component is about, um, about the reimbursement, about the practicing pattern and then know so forth. And then um, I just wanted, I don't want it to step on a turf that practitioner who wanted to have a control of the assessment or screening of the patients to give up to the other people who are not a practitioner or the healthcare provider to, uh, to oversight and losing the momentum of the, uh, um, you know, the uh, um, from ecosystem and of the return on investment. In the meantime, so of course, the amplifying the power of the device to have all the benefits that the patient could receive to assess their, their uh, cognitive function is the goal. So therefore I turn to Dr. Hashmi to comment on that. Um, what's the best pattern do you think, you know, um, to maximize the benefits of our device were not causing any setback of the, uh, the ecosystem for, you know, the, uh, for reimbursement, yeah. Yeah, it's great. Thank you for asking, Dr. My, you know, my, my short answer would be um, we need to really democratize the system, right? And so there's a status quo right now, which I'll be um, very uh, blunt even, uh, is, is, is to a large extent self-perpetuating. You know, why should it again be the domain of a few? Is there specialized knowledge? I mean, we live in a world where knowledge is at our fingertips, right? It's only a one search, web search away. And so it shouldn't be there. It is no longer the province of a few, nor should it be, nor can it be, right? It needs to answer that. So, so I think that, um, you know, the existing status quo, it, we need to be together as jointly as a team, be very intentional disruptors of the status quo. And yes, there's an ecosystem that is in place right now. Healthcare is in crisis because of that ecosystem. So if you've got an ecosystem that isn't really, um, you know, fostering uh, well-being, then it needs to be actively disruptive and replaced, honestly, with, 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 a, with a newer ecosystem in which everyone in that ecosystem is working in service of the patient and family, working to top of license, and is very honest about their own strengths and limitations. I mean, that's absolutely okay. I mean, I would be the first to sort of admit that. The reason that we've, we've, we've been failing for the last 30 plus years is exactly because this is missing. There is a lot of lip service that I hear all the time about, yes, interdisciplinary teams, et cetera. But do I see a real interdisciplinary team? I haven't seen that yet. I mean, the beginnings of it is sort of in the work that 
you know, you've both been doing, uh, and and I hope that we can uh, we can join you in that work. Yeah, and so yeah, so I just added to you know quickly, and then I I I, I totally agree. This this uh, you know status quo um, need to be changed, and then there's really really related to how and what. So um, I, I I don't know if you remember our our company's mission, and then that listing on the website. I really love this, and I always broadcasting that that's you know to the audience and the number one is to elevate the gold standard of cognitive health assessment that's is really we are feeling into status quo but we reform that and make it is better second is reduce the stigma of cognitive issues okay and finally empower action with early detection this is our mission so as long as we can fulfill our mission the status quo will be renewed and the new you know, standard will be implemented, which is beneficial on both sides. You know, as, as I listen to you both talk, and if I was a clinician, I would run out right now and go get a product and start, uh, start implementing this because, you know, I, I, feel it, I feel as though I'm now part of a team where, you know, as I, a lot of my, my colleagues will have kind of felt like they're on the sidelines, right? And so this conversation allows them to kind of view themselves as more of you know part of the healthcare landscape as opposed to sitting on the sidelines. And in in, in in you know the organic conversation that's taken place here, I hope uh, the viewers will see that. But one of the issues that we face as a profession, and, and again we have to be honest and blunt here, is cognitive. You know, the cognitive component is not really part of our training as audiologists. And so my question to you both is. What advice would you give an audiologist about getting development and education in this area so that they can become more vibrant uh, players in this space, in this ecosystem, to make things more efficient and help our patients who really need this, this kind of information? Yeah, my, my, my own uh, you know, two cents on that would be um, a lot of it is going to be um, a renewed self, um, self belief, if you will, you know, when you have been deliberately, uh, I would say, you know, sidelined for a long time, I can only imagine how frustrating it must feel that, look, I am, you know, the missing piece here of this patient's, you know, solution here. And, and I'm not sort of, I'm waiting for someone to give me permission to come in to the field of play. And I, I think that we have to give ourselves permission, right? And we have to partner with, I mean, my team always tells me, well, you know, we should work with people who want to work with us. There are people who want to work together and disrupt that status quo and form a new team. It's about, you know, that's what, you know, sort of uh, this week in hearing is all about. I mean, your, your webinar brings together people who do want to work together and can see a different future. And I think as long as those people are there, there's a lot of hope for the future. So I think that, Belief should be there that, yes, there may be a lot of people who are stuck in the past, but there are also a set of people who don't like that past and want to move to something new, and they will be very willing to partner with you. The other thing is it's bidirectional, right? And it's incredibly feasible. None of this stuff is rocket science. There are people who are perpetuating this myth that it is rocket science, because if it is rocket science... And none of us can be trained in cognitive, uh, you know, screenings and sort of assessments and interpretation. Then we're in real trouble, right? And and, and that is in fact not the case, um, because the people who claim that this is their province or domain, they were trained as well. And so it's our failure as educators, my failure or anyone else's failure, if we can't pass on this knowledge and share that. And when I say bi bidirectional, I mean I know next to nothing about audiology. Do I want to know? Of course. I get asked about this all the time from my patients. So I think as long as that mutual enrichment is there, um, that's the only way that we're going to move forward. So th that would be sort of my advice. And uh, Dr. Ma, that would invite your, your comment on it. I, I totally agree. And I think the time timing is good. Uh, the reason why that said timing is good, you know, the in the leading by John Hopkins, which is a uh, world a famous uh, medical society in that they pointed out, hey, 
pay attention on audiology, pay attention on hearing loss. You know, long-term hearing loss is a really disaster. It's becoming a number five, number one modifiable risk on top of the hypertension, TBI, alcohol consumption, and, uh, you know, the um, obesity in your midlife. Now, you know, so I, I think number one is awareness. Awareness across the board, because there's only about 14,000 audiologists in the nationwide, and it's not very difficult to get everybody's aware. So second is, you know, once you're aware, how are you going to do it? Because without, without a connection to the mainstream medical practices, your awareness is just kind of a left out. Right. So like uh, Dr. Hasby mentioned, it has to be, you know, has to be, has to be connected, has to be connected. And then the acceptance from uh, medical, you know, societies and then also connected with medical society and from audiology is the key and the network together uh, to, to make it a circle. And, they, and you know to make a loop and a circle, and then they, you, eventually you will becoming a voice. So this modeling and a voice become a voice of a bigger, um, you know that the bigger voice that's you know quality of life, patient care, patient first. It's not you, not me, not non MD, not MD, but patient. So therefore, you know, you know we got it to lower down those those numbers. There's a 5.8 million diagnosed with Alzheimer today, and then estimate the over 10 million and, you know, all together, you know, and that diagnosis and then diagnosis. So in 2050, plus is pandemic influence. So how many are going to be? So, you know, if we don't do it now, you know, our healthcare system is going to be collapsed later. Yeah, well said, well said. And so, you know, to my, to my peers, it's an open invitation to engage in this arena. Um, you're going to have to invest in yourselves. Uh, you have physician partners that are willing to welcome you onto the field. And uh, I think it's an exciting time. I think it's an exciting opportunity. Uh, and it's an evolution uh, in, in the profession, you know, as we continue to grow from uh, the 50 or 70 years that we've been around. And so I think it's a, uh, it's a great place to be as audiologists. Um, we're almost at the end here. So any final thoughts, gentlemen, before we conclude here? I'll, I'll, I'll say, uh, I'll say that, you know, um, I haven't mentioned that we have, um, we have a large, um, four, uh, you know, 13, 14 size of, um, real world data collection, which is perspective designed, you know, following the routine practice of, uh, of audiology, uh, clinics that's based on uh, a palace study of Dr. Joe Davis in the, uh, in Austin to engage engage or implement and the do track of a cognitive uh, cognitive uh, assessment and the hearing uh, hearing uh, you know assessment and then while you're carrying the hearing loss of patients and you follow up whether there's improvement of a cognitive function so this will give us uh, give us uh, um, uh, the benefits of awareness. And also the information built based on data, that data will be becoming uh, evidence that's showing and demonstrate, hey, the number one modifiable risk factor that we're carrying and we are practicing is really true message. Whether or not you accept it is there. So it has to be, has to be engaged it require all the entire medical societies to work together. You know, that will be referral, that will be, you know, um, reverse and uh, for the patients that are coming back and to adjustment. And then they're going to be, and uh, um, the one result, which is quality of life of patient improvement. Yeah. As well said, Dr. Ma, my, my, my last thought would be, um, you know, the existing health system and the way that we are now in crisis uh, is because health system has been tone deaf. Uh, I'm sure our audiology colleagues will appreciate that to what needs to be in place. And the only way that we're going to find a voice for that, as Dr. Ma and you know, Dr. Ma, both of you have said, is to generate the research. Uh, there's a lot that needs to be done. There's good work that has been done, but I think 
the call is there to join hands and do more of this work so that we can put in the evidence which you know establishes beyond a shadow of a doubt that this is the way to, of the future. So um, appreciate the opportunity to discuss today. Well, thank you, gentlemen. It's it's been really enlightening. I um, I always when we do these, I always learn something new, and I certainly learned a lot here. Um, hopefully, you know, a few months down the road or in 2022, we'll have the opportunity to re-engage, uh, have uh, you know maybe this conversation and some additional ones. And I really appreciate your time and your expertise. And uh, uh, you know, my colleagues, I'm sure will uh, will find this really really enlightening and favorable as they start to evolve and take cognitive screenings as part of their clinical practice within their state licensure.